All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. Uh, before I go on to the main subject here, which is fun with rabbis, refuting a rabbi's attack on the book of Hebrews. Just happened to run into that. It's a red herring. I ha couldn't let it go by. It baited me. It trolling us. All right, before I get to that, uh, dispensationalism and the New Covenant I had bought this book a number of years ago. It was copyrighted in 1965 by Charles C. Ryrie. I thought he would be a reliable source uh, on what dispensationalism actually teaches, if there is such a thing as standard dispensationalism. And it's definitely moving from where it was. But uh, So what does dispensationalism say about the New Covenant? Is it for the church or for Israel only? I think they generally taught the New Covenant pertains to Israel alone, not to the church, which is utterly impossible. You, you, you cannot understand the New Testament if that is your view. You do not. You haven't read the New Testament if that is your view, almost. Obviously, Charles Ryrie has read the New Testament, but... I, I was unwilling to read through this whole book again. I remember why I uh, thought this was a waste of money. is because this is not a presentation of dispensationalism. It's an apologetic for dispensationalism. And he spends all his time complaining about people that attack dispensationalism as being unbiblical. Because it is unbiblical in too many places. So what does he say about the New Covenant? Nothing, as far as I can tell, without digging through it word by word. Uh, so I looked in the index to see what, if I could find a reference to the New Covenant in the index. Of course, the index is just slightly over a page long. Subject index. But the subject of the New Covenant is not in the index, which is negative evidence, but it is evidence that it's not important to Charles Ryrie. Based on this, at least. Uh, just a short look at it. All right, so, and if that's true, if, if the dispensational view is the new covenant is not for the church, then the church does not exist. Then Jesus accomplished basically nothing on the cross. If Jesus was not fulfilling the promises of God given in the Old Testament, then he didn't accomplish what he did. But, of course, he rose from the dead, so he did accomplish God's promises. He did do what God sent him to do. Therefore, the new covenant is for the church. Where, where does this Holy Spirit come from? The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament promises of the new covenant. What did, he, what did they think? What did Ryrie and the others, what did uh, Darby and Schofield and all the others think? That Jesus just made these things up? Unconnected. See, you don't know the Old Testament. That, that's the foundation. God promised a deliverer all the way back in the Garden of Eden. If you throw out the Old Testament, you've got no promise of a Messiah. Who is Jesus then? Just an empty tomb? They stole the body? Nonsense! Dispensational disbelief. It, it is a wacky system that doesn't make sense. In the most important thing, Israel and the church being separate, completely contrary to the Apostle Paul, comes from the minds of men that were rather weird. 
and others bought into it. Why? I don't know. Perhaps because Reformed Covenant theology wasn't any good either? Go back to the scriptures. Find the truth. It's, it's in your face. How can you believe? You can't believe the New Testament and believe what some of these dispensationalists have taught about Israel and the church, about the New Covenant not being for the church. If, there, if the New Covenant is not for the church, there is no church. There is no church. No, oh, understand nothing. So speaking of people that understand nothing, I was searching YouTube. I was looking for, I, I searched for Israel and New Covenant, trying to avoid the, the, some of the other stuff and narrow it down. So what is the New Covenant, or the dispensational view of the New Covenant and Israel and the church? Does the New Covenant apply to the church? Or was it just a promise to Israel, which they have never received? Well, <clears throat> I happen to, uh, YouTube threw up uh, a video for me, <clears throat> vomited forth, as they always do, <clears throat> and a lot of irrelevant things, too. They always want to throw up things that have nothing to do with what you ask for. They are a bad search engine. They do that deliberately for the love of money. They try to get you to, to look at what they want you to look at instead of what you're searching for. Bad search engine. Shame on you, YouTube. Shame, shame on you, Google. Love of money is rid of all kinds of evil. All right, it's not bad enough that they put ads everywhere. Okay, so let's... This rabbi, okay, so we're going to play about less than a minute of, of his, his introduction. Let me bring it up on the screen here. Okay, this... Uh, make sure I've got everything on there. Okay. Say so. This is uh, church corrupted the Bible to create Christian New Covenant. Rabbi Tovia Singer, Jeremiah thirty-one. He's got seventy-eight point six thousand subscribers. And down below it says, "Help us combat aggressive evangelism evangelization in Israel." Well, they deport anybody that speaks about Christ, basically. When I went over there, I got into a, well, a heated discussion with a rabbi that was trying to come around evangelizing Gentiles at the place I was staying. Lecturing. Attacking the church. Attacking Christ. A, for, a rabbi who was a formerly a Pentecostal. So he was an apostate. Anyway, we had some discussions, and I heard that he was going to try to get me deported because I was a missionary. No, I wasn't. I just didn't agree with him. And I was winning the arguments because I preached Christ from the Old Testament. He didn't like that at all. In fact, he got so angry, he told me when the Messiah comes, we're going to put people like you to the sword. Yeah, he threatened me. He said, we're going to kill you when the Messiah comes. Well, we, their Messiah is not the Messiah of Israel, not the Messiah of the Bible, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, that makes you wonder sometimes. See, that, that's a response of people. Well, if you, if you are proclaiming Christ, that's what I was doing. I was proclaiming Christ. I was pointing to the Old Testament scriptures. So all these point to Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. He said, why are you calling him that? Because he's a Messiah. Okay, so Jesus the Messiah. Or Joshua. Yeshua is the same, same as the name Joshua. And of course, Moses could not bring Israel into the promised land. Because of Moses' sin. Joshua, whose name is, is in English would be translated or trans, tr transmangled as Jesus, same name, Yeshua, 
did bring Israel into the promised land. What Moses and the law could not do, Jesus did. Old Testament picture. God has a sense of humor. And knows how to do a play on words, too. Getting people the right name for his purposes. All right, so here's this rabbi accusing the author of Hebrews of corrupt, deliberately corrupting the Old Testament text of Jeremiah 31. I implore you to consider looking this up. And you have to ask the question, whoever wrote Hebrews change what it says in Jeremiah 31. It says, I was a husband, changed to, I rejected you. How do you play with the Bible? Are you insane? That's all we need to hear. He challenged me to look it up. And you know what that means. It is Bible time. So let me get that off the screen and go over to my favorite Bible program that you can't buy anymore. Bible Works. It is so good. <laughs> We're refuting heretics and rabbis. Have fun with rabbis today. So Jeremiah 31 this, he's actually referring to verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. Yes, it says husband in the current Hebrew text, which is what the King James used. Basically, I understand like the critical text, uh, New American Standard, uses a slightly older Hebrew text, but it's still a Masoretic text uh, dating from about 1000 AD. That's the oldest extant, extant um, Hebrew texts of the entire Old Testament are about a thousand years old. Only a thousand years old. Christian texts are far older than the Hebrew text today. Although they did discover some scrolls of the Old Testament in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But when Rome destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, most of the existing Hebrew texts, now remember, Hebrew was not known in most of the Jewish world. They used Greek. That was a common language. Most of Jews in Jesus' day did not live in the land of Israel. Just like today, most Jews in the world, although almost half the Jews live in Israel, live someplace else. Actually, almost half live in the United States, and the other half lives in Israel, with a few scattered around the current situation. Which is relatively re uh, recent, because a lot of Jews, uh, prior to the 1980s, lived in the Soviet Union. And then they gradually were able to come out. Then there was a huge, what they call an aliyah, uh, going up to the land. And they also brought Ethiopian Jews, and which are, I bet their text is considerably different than the, uh, than the standard Jewish text today. The text from Ethiopia. I have strong suspicion about that. <laughs> anyway, so here we have Jeremiah 31, and it says, though I was a husband to them. That's what it says. The rabbi is correct. That's what the Hebrew text says. Now, in uh, go over to uh, Hebrews 8.8. 8. For finding fault with them, that is, with the law, the commandments, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, finding fault because the law could not save anyone, it only condemns. Not according, so here's where the writer of Hebrews picks up Jeremiah 31. Not according to the covenant I made with, them, with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, the Exodus, because they continued not in my covenant, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Yep, Hebrews is different than Jeremiah 31. The writer of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah 31. And it's not identical to the current Hebrew text. What's going on? So did the author corrupt the text deliberately to say that God 
had given up on the Jews that he just delivered out of Egypt? That would be a little odd, wouldn't it? Was it a deliberate corruption by the, the author of Hebrews? Was it a corruption at all? No. Obviously, the rabbi needs to study his own Bible a little bit better, especially the Greek translation of his Bible. So let's go back to uh, Jeremiah 33, 31, and I will show you what the issue is. Why Hebrews says, I regarded them not. Okay, so here we have the English, common English translations. Uh, New King, King James, New King James, New American Standard, Young's Literal, uh, which is a freely available um, translation of the same original text as the King James. And then we have the LXE, which is an English translation of the Septuagint, otherwise known as the LXX. So LXE is LX English, LXX English. LXX is the Roman numerals for 70. It's also 70. 70? That's 10. 70. Is that 70? All right. Seven. I don't have 70 fingers. Thank God for that. Uh the LXX is the Roman numerals for 70, 50 plus 10 plus 10. If you remember your grade school, do they still do that in grade school? I don't know. And uh, it's also called the Septuagint, which is, word means 70, because according to legend, 70 scholars translated the Hebrew text into uh, Greek under I can't uh, under Ptolemy, a relatively famous uh, king of Egypt, Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, and supposedly they did seventy different individual translations, and when they compared them, they were all identical. That that's the story. So it's called the LXX or the Septuagint, and it was produced about. Roughly 200 years before the time of Christ. So this predates Christianity. So what does the LXX say? Well, we'll look at the English translation here. Because I don't want to struggle through the The Greek in that time was slightly different than the biblical Koine Greek, too. So often I'll find words that aren't in the lexicon. Uh, it says here in the English translation of the LXX, uh, Jeremiah 31, 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they abode not in my covenant, and I disregarded them. Huh. The LXX is the same as the, as the New Testament Hebrew text, the, the New Testament quote uh, from Jeremiah 31, 32, that's present in the book of Hebrews. Isn't that interesting? Well, it turns out that almost all the Old Testament citations in the New Testament are exact quotes from the LXX, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. What's going on? Did the authors of the LXX corrupt it? For Christian reasons? 200 years before the time of Christ? No. See, what we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which we don't have a complete New uh, Old Testament present in that, but we got like the book of Isaiah almost complete and fragments of everything else, is, is that in the time of Christ, in the time before the destruction of the temple, there were multiple textual versions of the Old Testament. Just like today, we have multiple textual versions, variants in different manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, the New Testament, they're very consistent. Even the most weird and wacky texts from Egypt are, are not that far removed from the standard text, which would be like the majority text, or the King James, which is like in the majority text family, the Byzantine text family, where the, all the manuscripts are virtually identical. What you have, what you have from Egypt, you have older manuscripts, and they that pres, pre, were preserved basically because it's desert, it's dry, parchment, 
uh, and uh, papyrus do not last very long in almost any climate. It'd have to be very dry to preserve them for 2,000 years. So because of and because of a text isn't used, if it's put in the back storage unit in a dry climate or in the monastery someplace or in a cellar someplace in a dry environment and it's not being used, it'll last for a long time. Just like a Bible. If you put a Bible on the, sh uh, on the shelf and you never crack it open, it'll be in mint condition. If you use it every day, it'll fall apart in a couple of years. Even a good leather Bible uh, after, say, 10 years of daily use, it's getting pretty rough. Things are starting to break down. So unused texts last longer than texts that are often used. <laughs> yeah, but these scholars, of course, they don't consider practical applications of human experience. No, they've got their own theories. But it, regardless of that, it doesn't matter. Uh, any, none of the Old Testament texts, the erratic texts, that do not correlate well together. The Egyptian texts, they, they don't agree with each other uh, very well, not compared to the Byzantine, the common textual family, which are exceedingly close. Not exact copies, but they're exceedingly close. It wasn't, uh, it, there, you can see there's different families, but they're all really close. You can see the same variant in a whole line over a period of, of centuries, which sort of like a fingerprint that identifies them. But they all say the same thing. We're talking about really minor variations, Sp a slight spelling change. Same word, different spelling. That's what usually happens. Or maybe a different word order, which doesn't mean a thing in Greek most, most of the time. doesn't mean anything. Switch the words. And because this was a living language, it would, wouldn't be common, uncommon to it or a, a, trans, a different word. It, we, could, we would expect if a if a particular word had gone obsolete and you've got a living text, a text that's being used, there would be a tendency to replace that with the equivalent word that is in current use. That's not a change in meaning at all. That is not a meaningful variant. That's the kind of thing we see almost universally. In, uh, lots of these tiny things that are of no significance. There's only a few variants that have any meaning change at all. And if you read the Bible in context and as a whole, uh, they don't affect our understanding. They're just things like, how do we interpret this? Well, you interpret it in a large scale. Oh, okay, if we, if we take it that way and interpret it so it fits with the rest of the Scripture, not a problem. I can think of one issue in John where they call the old, some of the text referred to the only begotten God which is weird. How can God be begotten? That means he had a beginning. I would say, I realize some of the Reformed brethren have a different explanation. Eternally begotten. Explain that to me, brothers. Eternally birthed, that would be a long time in labor. All right. I'm not mocking the Bible. I'm mocking some of my brothers that buy into some of this weird paganism. You know, it's, it's rooted in Aristotle uh, and the unchangeability of God, the absolute unchangingness of God, which creates a problem for the incarnation, doesn't it? Brothers, sisters, isn't that a little difficult to explain the incarnation that God became flesh and dwelt among us? Well, but God doesn't change at all. Yeah, I realize that the hypostatic union. I know about that. It still doesn't explain it. Because John says, And the Word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father. Okay, so uh, back to this uh, rabbi issue. Um. So if we look at the LXX, again, it reads, or the English translation reads, I disregarded them, which is what the rabbi accused of being a corruption by Christians, the Christian author of Hebrews. No, he is, re is, is quoting from a text that is identical to the LXX, to the Greek translation, the Old Testament Greek translation, done 
200 years roughly prior to Christ. So obviously the author uh, was, was quoting, uh, see, the rabbi simply has a bad Hebrew text, perhaps. So with the LXX, since this was a very carefully produced text and was Ptolemy, if I remember right, is the one that did it. So, I mean, there was unlimited budget here. And he wanted a, a, a for his library at, oh, what was that city? The Muslims destroyed it. Destroyed the library, the famous library. See, they had texts from all over the world, and they had a publishing industry there. Uh, so they would, you know, have, it was mass production. They would have a reader and a room full of scribes, probably slaves, and the reader would, read from the text slowly, and they'd be all copying it down. So you could, if you had a hundred scribes in a room, you could mass produce things. About as fast as you could do printing press. Of course, it was a little more error prone. But of course, on a printing press, uh, like the original 1611 King James, that, well, they had, they had a, print, a version of the King James one time, was called the Naughty Bible. Because uh, in the scripture, somebody either deliberately... Now, they, they accused the man that, that was supposed to be responsible for this, and he was punished. But whether it was... A, it was something that could happen accidentally quite easy. But it was a very expensive error. They printed a Bible, and when it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, somebody left the knot out. So it says, thou, the King James Bible, the naughty version of it, says, Thou shalt commit adultery. I suspect it was just an accident, but there still was punishment involved. It's so easy to do something like that. Nevertheless, having doing having done printing myself over for several years. Uh, so anyway, this is not an error by the author of Hebrews. It is not a corruption introduced by them. Rather, it is uh, taken from a a text of the Old Testament that predates the Hebrew text the Jews use today by 1,200 years. The Christian New Testament predates their text. Our oldest manuscripts go back as a whole, uh, entire New Testament predate their Torah by 700 years. We have complete New Testaments, including complete Bibles almost, that were produced around 300, 350 A.D. that still exist. Constantine had ordered a number of them to be produced. And some of the existing manuscripts, it's been speculated they were like rejects. Uh, Alexandria was a city in Egypt. Slow memory. Very slow file access time. Alexandria was where they had the publishing industry. That was the great library that the Muslims destroyed. Uh, the, the commander that ordered it destroyed said, well, if it differs from the Quran, it's destroyed. If it says the same thing as the Quran, it's 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 extraneous. Then we already have the Quran, so destroy it all. Doesn't matter whether it agrees with the Quran or not. That was the attitude. Uh, Christians don't do that. We don't destroy stuff like that. Anyway, the so the accusation by this rabbi is simply false. The question is, is, is his Greek test, or that there's, a, there's been a debate, not widespread, but there's a debate among Christians that are serious about the Bible, whether we should be using the Greek Old Testament, which was used by the Christian church up until the time of Jerome uh, for the Old Testament, or should we use the, the Hebrew text as it now exists? Now, the Hebrew text, there's a problem. Um, because almost all the copies of the Hebrew text, the, the copies that were in the temple, were all destroyed in 70 AD. And the existing texts, they were far fewer in number, and they were a, a compiled, if I remember the history right, or the, the so-called, the 
I don't know if it's a true account or not. Supposedly a, a rabbi, I believe his name was Akiba, in the second century, compiled a standard Hebrew text from what was remaining. And that became the Hebrew Bible today, the Torah and the uh, uh, the Law and the Prophets today, the Old Testament today, was, was his workmanship. That's what I understand. That's what's said. Now, would he have a reason to change the text uh, and remove some of the texts the Christians were using to support Christ being the Messiah? Would he have motive to do that? I would say he would have motive and opportunity. Did the Christians corrupt the Bibles or did the rabbis? Did the rabbis corrupt it deliberately? Because they were persecutors of Christians. They hated the Christians. They were the original persecutors of the church. Not Rome, the rabbis. The Jews. Especially the rabbis. Now, Temple Judaism, Old Testament Judaism, died in 70 AD. No temple, no Old Testament Judaism. No Old Covenant. You cannot keep the covenant without the temple. So Judaism as it exists today is a bastard faith. It is not Old Testament Judaism. It's something the rabbis created as a replacement for Old Testament Judaism because without the temple, you cannot keep the covenant. So they invented a substitute thing, which is called rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism. It's a religion the rabbis invented that's contained today in the Talmud, uh, I think the, the, there was an early version of it, and then there was a later. There was a, uh, well, I don't want to get into those details. I have to re refresh my, my uh, knowledge of that anyway. But there's, so you had uh, Judaism, and Judaism, the Talmud, is vociferously anti-Christian. And as Paul said, they're hostile to all men. They, the attitude of the Jews in the Talmud, of course, there's a number of Jewish rabbis in there, uh, writings of the various rabbis is what it is, were hostile. They, they, their, their attitude toward Gentiles was just terrible. Their attitude toward Christ, and they concealed it eventually because they were persecuted out for, with cause. If the Gentiles knew what was in the, the Talmud, I would not be surprised if they rioted and drove them out of their towns. And then you had the issue of, of usury, Jew, the Jewish money lenders. And, of course, uh, you find that in the, in the uh, uh, writings of Shakespeare. What was the name of that? I can't remember off the top. I remember we had to read it in high school. Uh, the Pound of Flesh as Interest or security for the loan. Yeah, that, that was true. I mean, I don't know about uh, that particular thing, but the Jews were the money lenders in Europe because Christians, by law, could not loan money at interest. But the Jews could because they weren't Christians. And in the Old Testament, I believe they weren't to loan money to fellow Jews at interest, but they to unbelievers, they could. So they became the bankers. And of course, because of that, they'd load money to kings to fund their wars and everything else. They accumulated huge fortunes. The Rothschild family. And that brought resentment because the kings would have to tax their people to pay off the loans that they borrowed from, the, from these rich Jewish families, which led to persecution too. So you had two causes out there, and of course they were under the curse of God, the Old Testament, the curse of the law, uh, which spells out exactly what will happen to them if they do not follow God's word, and that's exactly what did happen to them, including the Holocaust. Read the curses of the law, and then consider Jewish history, and you'll see God's word being fulfilled. But as the writer, uh, as, as Paul says, God is able to graft them back into the olive tree, which is Christ, if they do not persist in unbelief. 
it is not see Moses speaks of Christ he says one will come after me who will be like me like Moses and him you must listen to everyone who will, who will not listen to him shall be cut off and we find in the new testament that those who do not believe in christ shall be cut off does that make any sense to you i hope it does so today the the rabbis again uh, rabbinical judaism has virtually no connection with the old testament they do not keep the law. They do not keep the covenant. The only thing they do is, is circumcise their boys. Uh, that, that's about all the law they keep. Uh, but that just bring, puts you under the law and makes you that much more guilty for not fulfilling the law. And God made it impossible for them to keep the old covenant when he had the temple destroyed, as Jesus said it would be. God's purpose was to pressure them they were pressuring god's people to go back to the old covenant god takes it off the scene destroys the temple can't go back there and to the jews it's like i provided a messiah the messiah came i sent christ believe on him and they say no we're not going to do that and in the talmud for example there is language concealed language now apparently at one time they they changed some of the text to protect the jewish community uh, from persecution because obviously Christians would get upset when they found out what the Jews were talking about saying about Jesus and uh, So they used rather a concealed language, but it's pretty obvious They were talking about him that he's now suffering in hell uh, in boiling manure up to his nose Human excrement up to his nose. That's his punishment now according to the Jewish rabbis where Christ is in hell, in boiling poo, human poo. That's So uh, you think Christians get angry with that? Yeah, they would drive them out of the towns. So they tried to conceal some of the stuff that was in the Talmud, but that kind of stuff is in there. Uh, they were, according to the rabbis, I remember reading some of this, and one of the things they had was that it was, you were not, to aid a Gentile. You are not to spare the life of a Gentile if you could, if it would not cause a danger to the Jewish community. So if you found a Gentile fallen into a pit and you could get away with it without anybody finding out, you were not to rescue him. You were to let him die because he was a Gentile. The only reason to rescue him was if it would put the Jewish community in danger because they found out that you left him there to die. Then you were supposed to rescue him for the sake of the community. But God wanted him dead. And as I said, the, the rabbi I had discussions with, the apostate Pentecostal I had discussions with in Jerusalem, what did I do? I preached Christ from the Old Testament. That's all I did. I said, well, you're not really re representing the Bible accurately. And I quote the scriptures. I didn't even bother to quote from the New Testament because I knew he didn't accept that. I said, hey, you accept the Old Testament. I accept the New Old Testament. Let's talk about that. He didn't like it. Because I was refuting him in the presence of the Gentiles he was trying to convert. And that's when he said, when Messiah comes, we're going to put you to the sword. People like you, we're going to kill with a sword. They're no different than the, the Muslim radicals. Maybe worse. They're, they're the enemies of Christ to this very day. He, he revealed his true colors when he got angry. Because he didn't want to hear about Christ. He didn't want me refuting his false doctrines, his attacking Christianity, which was what he was doing. Okay, so uh, fun with rabbis. It's not really fun discussing them, but uh, it's, it's, these this, they're, they're easy to refute. They don't even understand the history of their own books. The Bible is not central to them. The Torah, they read it, but they do not understand it. As the New Testament says, there's a, 
a veil over their eyes to this very day. When Christ returns, that will be removed, and they will see him and recognize him for who he is. And we'll be with him when that happens. But until then, don't think they're just half Christians that believe in the Old Testament. They do not. They do not. They do not practice it. They do not believe it. And they are hostile, not only to Christians, but to all non-Jews. As Paul, as Paul says, hostile to all men. And that's true. It's in their Talmud, which is written centuries after the time of Paul. So, uh, and if I, I am, this is information I got from reading the Talmud, not somebody's books attacking them. I go to the original sources. I read it, these very things in the Talmud that I mentioned. It's a fact. It is a fact. So, just to let you know, <laughs> And again, I experienced the the the, uh, the rabbis telling me what my future is uh, when their messiah, when their messiah comes. Uh, that messiah might be the antichrist, perhaps. Certainly, an antichrist messiah. That they uh, well, they actually did uh, receive a false messiah in the Second Jewish War in the middle of the second century. Somebody called uh, Bar Kokhba, a son of the. Uh, Son of the uh, stars, or son of the the, the sun, uh, the star, or something like that was what that name means, and uh, he led them in revolt against Rome, and of course lost a second time, and brought even more destruction upon the Jews, including exile from the land. And the at that time the Romans were so upset. <sighs> They plowed the Temple Mount and built a pagan temple uh, on it just to make sure the Jews would... Because it, at one point, the Jews had tried to rebuild the temple and God would not permit it. There was earthquakes and fire erupting from the ground, probably natural gas, uh, and uh, they, they, they had to stop. They, they could not build the temple, rebuild it. God would not permit it. So all you people out there thinking that God's going to let them rebuild the temple, it would be a blasphemy to rebuild the temple. Uh, the temple is the church. Christ is the God of the temple. Yes, he is our, uh, we are his holy of holies, the nows of God, the Christians, born-again Christians. We are the temple of God. Whether you're Gentile or Jewish, from natural origin. But in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, no, no, no Jew nor Gentile. It's one new man, the new creation that's in Christ, in the new covenant. And people that don't believe the new covenant is for the church, what do they have? If that's what just dispensationalists believe, that the new covenant is for the Old Testament of Israel and not for the church, what kind of church do they believe in? What kind of salvation do they believe in? What kind of cross do they believe in? What did Jesus do on the cross? It is just nonsense. It is madness. It has to be a doctrine of devils to be that bad, to attack the new covenant, the promises of God for his people, both Jews and Gentiles. Who else would invent such doctrine? Who else? It, that's, that's just outrageous. That's an outrageous doctrine. Shows complete ignorance or, or complete failure to understand the scriptures. It's so clear. 